Europe is a continent with a long, convoluted prehistory, with multiple waves of early humans across various species appearing in different parts of the region at different times. Homo sapiens first set foot in Western Europe around 47,000 years ago, whereas Homo erectus, potentially our direct ancestor, appeared in the southeastern reaches of the continent as early as 1.8 million years ago and travelled no further west than Central Europe. Who though were the first Western Europeans? Well you might be surprised to learn that they were not Homo sapiens, but neither were they Homo erectus. Homo antecessor first appears in the fossil record about 1.2 million years ago, evolved from a population of Homo egaster, and this species was likely the first members of the human genus to reach the western reaches of Europe. They are not a well known species in the public eye, but there are some remarkable similarities with antecessor and modern Homo sapiens, and today we will be exploring them all in close detail. Just who were these strange new visitors to the west? How did they live and ultimately how did they disappear? Much of what we know of Homo antecessors appearance comes from the skull of a young child between the ages of 10 and 11 and a half, which was discovered at the Grandolina site, part of the Sierra de Atapuerca archaeological complex in what is today the western European nation of Spain. This site has yielded several fossils, including the body remains of some adults but it's this skull that has allowed both paleontologists and anthropologists to gain an insight into the facial appearance of this primate. The most striking feature of Homo ancestors visage would have been its entirely flat face, a feature that was retained throughout the species entire life. This would have given it an appearance much more in line with archaic human species from the early Pleistocene rather than with Homo sapiens, but there were some distinct similarities between these apes and ourselves. Specifically, the nasal bones resemble our own, and the jaw bones are highly mobile and lightly built, unlike the robust bone structures found in earlier hominins. The frontmost teeth, the incisors, were shaped like shovels, while the molars appear to be similar to those seen in Neanderthals. Females would have had smaller teeth than males, with proportionally less gum coverage across them as a whole. This perhaps could mean that a higher degree of dimorphism was present in males and females across the wider body too. An adult Homo antecessor specimen, uncovered from the same site as the young child, seems to have measured between 162 to 186 centimeters or between 5.5 feet to just over 6 feet in height. This estimation comes from a clavicle bone thought to belong to a fully grown male, whereas a much more gracile radius bone shows an animal which stood roughly 172 centimeters or 5 foot and 8 inches tall. Metatarsal bones from the hominin's feet seem to tell a different story still. In males, they give estimations of around 173 centimeters, or 5 foot and 8 inches in height, whereas females are indicated to have grown around 168 centimeters, or 5 foot and 6 inches in height. Importantly, there isn't a massive degree of difference here, which means that these height estimates are likely to be accurate and that males did tend to grow slightly larger than females overall. Looking at the bones of Homo antecessors ankles make them out to be robust, which is particularly unusual given the fact that some elements of the body are more gracile. This may be an adaptation to have helped the hominin withstand pressure and stress on the foot as it walked, and may also indicate that these apes were generally more robust and heavily built than we first thought. 
fossilized trackways that match the proportions of these animals' feet, indicates that they likely made it as far north as what would one day become England, and they seem to be closely linked, at least in appearance, to Neanderthal footprints that have been found across Europe. Despite the similarities, Homo antecessor is thought to have had longer limbs than Homo neanderthalensis, and these limbs seem to have been thinner and more gracile than the typically stocky, thick limbs of Neanderthals. Artists' renditions of Homo antecessor have a lot in common with those depicting Neanderthals, almost looking like a strange cross between Homo neanderthalensis and Homo erectus. They were tall and largely hairless, save for the hair on their heads and face, with prominent brow ridges and large noses. They are not depicted with advanced technologies, such as clothes and huts, and are typically shown using basic stone tools in caves or out on the plains of Western Europe. Just how large was their stone tool arsenal, however? The Gran Dolina site in Spain is by far the most reliable location for scientists studying this archaic human species, and has indicated that these primates were adept at developing stone tools to fit different purposes in their life and society. Unlike the humans that came before them, Homo antecessor seems to have taken great care in crafting the overall shape of the stone tool first before flaking it down to size with a sharper stone. This shows a high degree of intent and preparation not seen in more archaic species, and they were even able to make early, crude bifaces, a form of ancient knife, through using this method. Some of their tools are particularly advanced, bearing a resemblance to those of the Acheulean stone tool industry, which would appear in Western Europe almost a good one million years later. Scientists don't currently know if later humans adopted these tools from the foundations that Homo antecessor had already lain, or if they were developed entirely independently by the Homo sapiens who first reached the region. Hundreds of stone tools have been unearthed from the Grandolina site, indicating that Homo antecessor had been living in the region for a long time. These tools change slightly as scientists dig in different locations, which show how the tools adapted to different jobs over time. Some tools show evidence of having been used to cut flesh, meaning not only that these hominins had a taste for meat, but that they were adept at preparing and cutting it using their basic stone tools. Many stone tools across Grandolina are made of chert, a hard, sedimentary rock. But Homo antecessor also seems to have collected and crafted tools made of quartz, sandstone and limestone. All of these resources were available within just a few miles of the Grandolina site, meaning that while Homo antecessor likely travelled a lot in the immediate vicinity of their home, they didn't need to go far to find a constant stream of resources with which to craft their tools. The site also shows evidence of Homo antecessor's tools being retouched over time. Perhaps as they lost their sharpness and became blunt, an early stone worker would go back over their previous flaking and napping work to produce a more refined tool once again. Some tools have intentional notches that would have been used to serve a certain purpose, while others are pointed at the tip and may have been used to pierce flesh rather than to cut it. Some are clearly scrapers, used for removing skin or for cutting flesh, while others resemble choppers that may have been used to break into bone. While Homo antecessor clearly had a good grasp on chopping up and cutting their food, there is very little evidence that they knew how to cook it. The only charcoal particles found across Grandolina are thought to have been blown over by the wind from neighbouring areas where natural fires might have started in hot, dry patches. But this leaves an interesting question. If they didn't have clothing technology, and they couldn't heat themselves with a controlled fire, how did they stay warm in the often cold climates of Europe? 
especially those living in what would become northern France and England. Well, in addition to the climate being a few degrees warmer in Homo antecessor's day, the species may have been more naturally suited to withstanding lower temperatures than we are. They have been theorized to have had high metabolisms, and likely enjoyed diets packed with protein to help them withstand the cold. In the regions which Homo antecessor frequented, freezing was rare, with the abundance of deciduous trees such as olive and oak. In the north, Homo antecessor appears to have lived in sheltered areas, such as spruce and pine forests, and while climates were cooler than they are in Spain, they were not intolerable. Homo antecessor's protein-rich diet meant that the species enjoyed a lot of meat. Fortunately, there was no shortage of large animals to hunt in the region, and the fossils of these animals have also been found interspersed between the remains of the humans themselves. Living and extinct species were preyed upon by the first Western Europeans, and they seem to have been eating everything from deer to bears. The now extinct bush antlered deer seems to have been a favourite, but the still extant fallow and red deer were abundant too. Bison, boar and horses would have made a good source of meat for more well equipped hunters, whereas some groups targeted animals as large as mammoths and as fierce as hyenas. More unusual sources of protein came from monkeys, rhinoceroses, wolves and an extinct species of bear known as Ursus dolinensis. Many of the bones of these animals are preserved with the indentations and cut marks of Homo antecessor's tools, and food seems to have been brought back and prepared at the site rather than in the field. Carcasses of large animals, where possible, were dragged back to the Grandolina site to be butchered and enjoyed by the whole group whereas with much larger animals such as mammoths and rhinoceroses, only the limbs or skulls were retrieved. This behaviour suggests that division of labour was well established in Homo antecessor societies, with some humans going out into the field forming hunting parties, while others stayed at the home site preparing a meal for the troop to eat. They seem to have been living in large numbers, and this seems to have granted them a degree of safety. Only 5% of all known Homo antecessor specimens bear the marks inflicted from carnivore teeth and claws, and those that do largely seem to have been scavenged rather than hunted. That being said, predators were present here. Homo antecessor would have come under threat from not only bears, but also packs of hyenas, wolves, and the now extinct big cat Panthera gombazoogenesis also known as the European Jaguar. Homo antecessors seem to have also gathered wild crops to supplement their meat-heavy diets however, and the lands they inhabited were full of olives, hazelnuts, chestnuts and hackberries. While these would not have made up a significant part of Homo antecessors life, it was likely the role of some members of society to gather these crops, while other groups took to the wilds to hunt. There is also evidence to suggest that Homo antecessor enjoyed the storage organs of wild plants, such as the roots and tubers when foraging. Many of these resources would not need to have been cooked, and some were particularly filling, meaning that Homo antecessor could get a lot of nutrition from a relatively small amount of food. There is also a darker side, however, to Homo antecessor's culture which is little known in the form of cannibalism. The antecessor groups within the Grandolina seem to have targeted humans for meat when times were tough, and there is extensive evidence of bone smashing, muscle cutting and facial scarring. This takes an even more sinister turn however, when you learn that the majority of the individuals who were cannibalized seem to have been children or young adults who in turn were less likely to be able to defend themselves when it came to being killed. The theory states that a homo antecessor would have used a crude stone tool to smash into the cranium and obtain the brain of its victim, whereas some other evidence shows that they removed the flesh from human ribs, 
disconnecting bones from their sockets and dismembering limbs to obtain their meat. Due to the majority of cut and smash marks being located on Homo antecessors faces, it has been suggested that those consumed were in fact not members of the social group of the cannibals. Instead, they may have raided neighbouring troops for victims when food was needed, or perhaps the consumption of human meat served as a ritual purpose which has been long lost to the fossil record. Animal prey items obtained by Homo antecessor do not seem to have endured the same facial cuts. It's a particularly hard area of the body to obtain any meat from, and they seem to have gone through more effort to obtain it from the same species than they did with wild animals. Another explanation is that this may have been ritualistic cannibalism of members of the same tribe that had died from natural causes, and breaking into the skull was simply a symbolic practice for these people. Homo antecessor did not last in Western Europe, and by 770,000 years ago, they had all but disappeared from the forests and plains of Spain and England. As the world drifted towards the Ice Age, climate change seems to have been a primary factor in bringing this fascinating yet savage species to its knees. But it may also have faced competition as new species of human arose in the West. Homo antecessor was once thought to have been the ancestor of both modern humans and Neanderthals, but now it is more widely accepted that they were an offshooting branch on the modern human line, separating from us just before we separated from the Neanderthals. Some species, such as Homo heidelbergensis, may have outcompeted antecessor in Europe, leading to their ultimate downfall. By the time the humans and Neanderthals arrived on the scene, they were long gone, leaving only their surprisingly advanced stone tools, and the cracked remains of their cannibalized brethren.